the program. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks to the organisers and happy birthday, Paddy. Uh, I am. It was very excited, particularly to come here. I did a much. I used to do a lot more theoretical sort of work, things on event horizons and black holes and stuff, which Paddy helped me with during my PhD and after. Uh, but in the last decade or more, I've been focusing a lot more on observational cosmology and measuring a bunch of the things that our theories are uh, predicting. So that's what I'm going to focus on talking about mostly today. Now, I have to mention Charlie Lineweaver was my PhD supervisor and inspired by Charlie, who put this up, this sort of progression up earlier, this one extends a little bit further. This was the fields arranged by purity where the sociologists are in one corner and they, their sociology is just applied psychology and then psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry, which is just applied physics. And the physicist is there going, oh, it's nice to be on top. No, no, it's not about money. And then the mathematicians <laughs> say, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys way over there. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, since I'm in India and I realise I missed the uh, test match that was in Pune uh, last week, which is very unfortunate. And I do, did notice that during this session yesterday, um, a catastrophe occurred, <laughs> uh, which was Australia, I think, went down like by six for 50 or something like that. And India absolutely crushed us in the final innings. So... <laughs> I feel, felt it would be remiss of me to congratulate India for that particular uh, devastating loss on our part. Anyway, the topic... Yeah, to... 333 is really... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so anyway, the topic today is cosmology and the um, aim of my talk in some ways is to sort of remind people of, of just how many and the diversity of observations that there are now that our theories need to explain if we want to explain things like the cosmological constant or dark energy or um, dark matter or whether there's any extra species of neutrinos or particle physics, these kinds of things. There's a lot, a huge number of constraints that we have now. So any new theory that's trying to explain any of these has many hoops to jump through, essentially. Uh, so these, the kind of things that are there are from everything from nucleosynthesis to even the age of the universe being older than the, the youngest, uh, the oldest stars. Uh, the sound horizon scale, both in the CMB and how that translates to the power spectrum of fluctuations and the luminosity distance of, uh, then, then the luminosity distance of supernovae, angular diameter distances to um, the cosmic microwave background, as well as baryon acoustic oscillations, Gravitational lensing, both strong and weak gravitational lensing. The growth of structure, not only just how, how statistically things are growing when you're watching redshifts, but also peculiar velocities when you can measure both redshifts and distances and get um, actual peculiar velocity measurements of things like bulk flows as well as higher order moments of the peculiar can you velocities. Tell me one believable result from weak gravitational lensing? Uh, <laughs> the bullet cluster? The bullet cluster? So that's one well, way. I think that's believable. That was from weak lensing. Uh, and this. <laughs> so, uh, with these many and varied. You can trust these observations. They are strongly supported by theory. In case you didn't hear that, that, you can trust these observations and they are strongly supported by theory. Um, it, that is a good point. So, cosmologists now have the audacity to try and to make plots or tables that look somewhat like this, where you have different um, parameters being measured and different combinations of data sets being applied. Uh, to the point where we're claiming things like the matter density of the universe to a sub 1% precision. Now, I want to make a very strong point here. This is um, data from the Planck collaboration, uh, or an analysis from them, um, on the six primary parameters in their base model. The numbers that you see here can change dramatically in different models. So just a reminder, everybody, never trust a number. Always make sure that you understand what model was used to derive it. Uh, so, but nevertheless, we are be able to measure things and look, at, look for consistency of these models with very high precision now. Uh, but still, we don't know the answer to a question such as, what is dark energy? So, 
the list that I usually put in here are something like, okay, so it's a cosmological constant, but what is that? Um, is that something that arises from emergent gravity? Uh, is it something that um, is a more general dark energy? Does it have a time-varying equation of state? Is there um, something that could be let, uh, so omega, or lambda does not equal to minus, or W does not equal to minus one? Um, do we get to vary our theory of gravity? Is there any hint of new physics in all of these diverse observations that we have to measure? And one of the ways that we look, use to look at that is to look for, the, is one of the reasons that different observa types of observations are important, is that if you have a metric like this, this is a more general metric than the usual Frieden Robinson Walker one, in which you can have different terms um, prefacing the spatial and temporal components, uh, which in general relativity would be equal, but in different theories may differ. Uh, and this is particularly important because clustering, for example, is sensitive to the spatial part, but lensing is spatial to, uh, uh, relevant to both. So if you can compare clustering measurements to lensing measurements, you can distinguish between different theories. This was brought home to me um, quite starkly by this paper that I wrote in 2007, which here I tested a whole bunch of different models. It doesn't really matter what they are, um, except for the fact that this is the distance modulus versus redshift, um, so it's matching to supernova data here. And the thing that I found was that all the models that are good fit to the data have lambda CDM as a subset of their possible parameters. And the best fit parameters in every case were the parameters that were consistent with lambda CDM. So all of the variety and extra um, flexibility these models have was not necessary when trying to explain the just pure expansion data. So that, that was when it became clear to me. And can you guys see this at all? Should I turn off more lights? Yeah, sorry, I, I did use dark slides. There we go, that's a bit better. You, you don't need to see me anyway. <laughs> um, so other types of measurements um, are needed. And how about I just leave the last one at the back on? Um, like, or, yeah, how's that? Um, so the kinds of measurements that we can do that will differentiate between theories that predict the same thing for expansion um, uh, is something like measurement of the growth of structure. This is how rapidly structures are moving, which can be measured both by looking at redshift space distortions and by peculiar velocities. Uh, the amplitude of fluctuations at the present day, so sigma eight. Uh, for there may be theorists in the room who do, have not encountered sigma eight. This is a rather, somewhat baffling parameter to some people. So just to make sure, um, all that is is if you take a sphere of radius eight megaparsecs and chunk it down over there, measure the density, plunk it down over there, measure the density, repeat that many times, take the dispersion. That's sigma eight. Um, and the reason that eight megaparsecs was chosen is that if you, when, when it was originally done, if you chose eight megaparsecs, the answer is approximately one in normalized units. Uh, the other things that you can do then is lensing. Um, and lensing affects things in multiple ways. It changes the shapes of galaxies. It also magnifies them or demagnifies them. So it changes their intensity. So we can do, use number counts and distributions uh, in order to uh, measure lensing. Okay, so this is the background into which falls the dark energy survey. And this was sort of the focus of what I was gonna talk about today, some of the things that are possible with DES. Now, the dark energy survey has been um, in being bred for quite some time. Uh, Ofo will tell us a bit more about it in the next um, talk as well. But essentially, it has 525 nights spread over five years on the CTIO four meter telescope in Chile. It's an imaging survey. This is the camera. It's a 570 megapixel camera. Very, very beautiful images. Um, and we take images in five different color filters uh, over this wide 5,000 square degree field, as well as time-lapse images weekly during the six-month season um, on certain specific fields where we look for supernovae and variable objects and track AGN, for example. Uh, it involves at least 400, some, somewhere in 400 to 500 researchers on at least four continents. Uh, it's a large collaboration with many diverse scientific goals. The four main stated scientific goals are to measure weak lensing, uh, galaxy clusters, and use those as number counts to constrain cosmology, 
measure baryon acoustic oscillations uh, and look at type 1a supernovae. So in total, we expect to find uh, 300 million galaxies, uh, which is a huge number, and 3,500 supernovae. Uh, that are not, we discover many more than that. Those are the ones that will be useful for cosmology. So it's a fantastic data set. Uh, the Dark Energy Survey collaboration, as I said, is spread around all over the place. Um, we've got the AusDES Consortium here in, in Australia down there. We've got Europe and well, as well as North and South America. Uh, so this is an image from the Dark Energy camera. Uh, are you able to see that a little bit? No? I'll turn off more lights. Okay, everyone ready? There we go. So this is an image from the Dark Energy camera. Uh, this shows the plane. Each one of these is a different CCD camera. Just to give you a scope for the field of view, it's a really wide field camera. That's the size of the full moon in relation to the view of that, of the camera. And to give you a measure of the detail with which we see things, that's a zoom in of one of the tiles to give you sort of the, a sense of just how intricate um, the, these um, images are, despite the fact that we have such a wide field of view. So we are now in the fourth year of a five-year survey, or we've completed fourth year of observing. This is the area of the sky that we cover, and it shows the sort of tiling pattern that, has got, that went on over the first three years. Uh, it's known as the tank for obvious reasons. Uh, compared to other surveys, the reason that this region was chosen is because there's a wealth of data at other wavelengths. Uh, this, the barrel of the tank, I guess, is the Stripe 82 from Sloan. Uh, and there's a few overlapping spectroscopic surveys as well. Um, and I'll bring your attention to these little red points here. Those are the fields that we're using, we're doing time-lapse photometry in so that we get, can look at variable objects. Um, they're known as the supernova fields because these are some of the main reg regions in which we're searching for supernovae. So I became involved in DES through AusDES, which is the Australian part of the Dark Energy Survey. Um, we use this instrument here, which is the 2DF instrument on the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Has anyone here used 2DF? Few people, literally three. So it's an amazing instrument. It's really, really fun to use. Um, and it takes spectra of objects that are discovered by DES, in this case. Uh, so we have 100 nights, also spread out over five years, actually moving into six now. Um, we only cover that 30 square degrees, which is the repeat images. Um, and we do spectroscopy, not photometry. Um, and it's only about 30 researchers in Australia, but we're very integrated with the whole dark energy survey. Now, the main goal for AusDES is type 1a supernovae, getting the red shifts so we can put the DES supernovae on a Hubble diagram. Uh, we're also focusing very strongly on AGN reverberation mapping, which unfortunately I won't get much time to talk about today, but we're monitoring 771 AGN between a redshift of 0.3 and redshift 4.5, with both photometry and spectroscopy, so we can do reverberation mapping and measure the masses of black holes and how those have evolved over uh, much of the lifetime of the universe. So that's a project I'm really excited by. Um, and other things like radio galaxies and photometric redshift training. Um, here's the Anglo-Australian telescope. I thought I'd show you a quick movie of 2DF in action because it's so cool. Ooh, I have the music sound on. We don't, we don't need the dramatic music. Um, <laughs> But this is the 2DF instrument, and what you can see it doing here is that on the tip of the telescope is the, is the instrument, and the robot is placing optical fibers at the positions of interesting objects that we want to take spectra of. So what happens is this flips around, points at the mirror of the telescope, uh, and each of these optical fibers receives light from an individual galaxy, which means we can uh, get spectra of 400 galaxies or supernovae or whatever objects are out there that we like to see. Um, 400 spectra at a time, which makes it a very efficient follow-up. Um, and why is it particularly efficient? Well, this is the field of view of the dark energy camera, and that's the field of view of 2DF. So we can very efficiently, just with single pointings, follow up single pointings of the dark energy survey. Um, each of these red circles is an example of where we could place an optical fiber. Uh, there are numerous redshift surveys that have been completed. This one was not on the uh, Anglo-Australian telescope. This is 6DF. Um, it was done on the, a telescope right beside it. Um, and here you see every dot here is a point, uh, is a galaxy. And you can see the distribution here where this is the southern hemisphere looking down here and this is the plane of the galaxy, which is why we don't have data along there. 
Now, many different uh, surveys have been done. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for example. And I've left these quite small because as time goes on, we go and we look at more distant but more narrow cones of the distribution of galaxies. So that's the two degree field galaxy survey. This is the gamma survey, which is looking out a bit further. These are only approximately to scale. This is the Wiggle survey, which I was very involved in. This um, occupied a good seven years of my life and we measured about 250,000 galaxies or 238,000 uh, with which we measured baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, and for comparison, this is what OSDES looks like. Uh, it's very narrow cones going out to a redshift of four and a half-ish, where this sort of break here where you see a lower density, that's a redshift of one. That's when the O2 line disappears off our spectrograph and makes it difficult for us to identify redshifts of galaxies. So this is the distribution that, we, that we're looking at. That's sort of all things put together. So this is like a distribution of some of the galaxies we've observed. Uh, now, the primary science goals, as I mentioned for DES, are these. So the large scale structure, just measuring the distance, we um, expect to measure 300 million galaxies out to a redshift of one and some beyond. Uh, we're also going to do weak lensing. The shape measurements should, we expect should be successful about two, 200 million of those galaxies. Uh, and then galaxy clusters, which you can use to um, measure the uh, cosmology as well, uh, will have tens of thousands of these. Uh, we're also using all of the, these hundreds of millions of galaxies that we're discovering as foregrounds for the cosmic microwave background to look at things like integrated sachs wolf effect, um, Sunyaev Zeldovich, and any effects where you have um, lensing of the CMB, et cetera, due to foregrounds. Um, by the way, I'm not going to use any particularly good graphics anymore, so you can turn the light back on if you want. <laughs> uh, here's some initial uh, data from the Dark Energy Survey. Oh, you really can't see that anymore, can you? Okay, sorry. Um, maybe turn one off. Um, so here's some data where you see the weak lensing uh, map that's been made. So this is the mass map that was made using the shapes of galaxies, um, superimposed with the positions of clusters of galaxies. So you can see that where there's um, the red is the lensing map and the dots are the clusters of galaxies. And you can see there's a good coincidence between the density uh, and the, uh, of, of known clusters and the amount of lensing we got from that area of the sky. Um, and here's sort of a, an image where you can see in these red spots here, which are the high density part of weak lensing, you can actually see the clusters, whereas in this big blue part, which should be a void, you see a very underdense region where there's not many um, galaxies. Uh, and I bring you back for a bit of history here because um, doing things like m counting the number of clusters is something that has a good history of showing that things like, or testing cosmology. And I bring your attention to these papers which were done in uh, 1990 uh, and claimed a, a cosmological constant of 0.8 uh, back in 1990, well before the supernova data. Um, and, sh and that was just done by using the structures and doing number counts of galaxies and clusters. So there's a couple of papers along those lines that predated the supernovae and got approximately the right answer. So now we're doing that at a much better rate. Okay, so knowing I have limited time, I focused on only one other thing here, which is what we can do to measure the expansion of the universe. Uh, and that's because it's somewhat close to my heart. I've been working on supernovae for a while. Here's an um, image from that image from DES showing you if you zoom in on a tile and then zoom in on a galaxy, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for when we're looking for supernovae. So we found um, thousands of these now. Uh, and just to compare to what um, exists, this was the original two papers, um, the supernovae. There were 42 supernovae with one filter uh, and 10 supernovae with, um, with two filters. And so the 3,500 that we're expecting to find in five filters is um, uh, significantly better than the original data. So moving right along, um, this is the, so th these are the, well, these were the contours that you had from the original in the matter density versus cosmological constant plane. And notice that this scale goes out to almost three um, for the matter density there. So this is the um, Batool et al. data from 2014. This is the state of the art for supernovae. And if I was to slide that onto the same scale, it looks about like that. So uh, we've improved a fair bit 
in 15 years or so, but not nearly as much as we would like. But if you add the CMB, which is very complementary here, um, you can see that the cosmic microwave background constraint here does not actually constrain lambda oil matter density very well on, alone, but com combined with something like supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillations, you get a much um, tighter constraint. So I very, very briefly wanted to mention this because a couple of people have asked me. There was a paper recently that claimed that the supernova evidence had de the evidence for acceleration due to supernova had decreased and should be considered marginal. Uh, this here are the contours from the plot that claimed that there was marginal detection of acceleration. And the basis of that claim is that the three sigma point here does encounter zero, zero just. Um, but they, so if you compare the, the difference between these two, there's a slight shift one way, but really it hasn't changed the result significantly at all, less than one sigma. So don't worry, the supernova data is still saying that there's acceleration. Okay, so quick pretty visualization. These are the spectroscopic supernovae that we've found, just shown going off in those cones. Uh, we've taken spectra of each of the supernovae here um, in this diagram. And this is an example of one year of data, how many supernovae that we're finding um, during a single year. You can see at any one point, we're getting light curve measurements for many different supernovae simultaneously. Uh, here's a Hubble diagram. Note we have not done the cosmology analysis for this. If I was giving this talk in a couple of months' time, I would have results to show. Uh, but at the moment, this redshift is blinded, so you can't use this to um, do cosmology. I can tell you that goes to approximately a redshift of 0.9 there. Um, and so, so far, we have the most number of supernovae spectroscopically confirmed from any single survey. Uh, that will improve more soon. But more excitingly, these are the supernovae that we've seen that we haven't got spectra for the supernova themselves, but we have got spectra for the host galaxy. So since we have good color information, we're able to tell the, that these are type 1As and put them on the Hubble diagram with the redshifts that we have from the host galaxy. So with some contamination, this is what we're the real strength of this um, and how we're going to do it. So here's an example of just the first two years of data that we have of how many supernovae we're able to put here. And we're working on the selection criteria. These are type 2 contaminants, almost certainly, up here. And we're using machine learning to try and figure out how to distinguish between these better. Um, OK, so with so many supernovae, not only are we going to measure the expansion rate of the universe over redshift to a beautiful precision, we can also do some things that previous supernova data sets couldn't do very well. Um, and that includes some things like peculiar velocities and lensing. Now, the supernova lensing, we know that some of the scatter in this Hubble diagram here is, not, is, is actually signal. So supernovae that, where the light travels along dense lines of sight uh, are going to be magnified, and supernovae that travel along under-dense lines of sight are going to be demagnified. That causes a skewness. The, the mean um, of the ma magnitude is the same, but it causes a skewness in the distribution. And we can correlate the demagnification and magnification with the density along the line of sight as a new way to test gravity. So we're, we're working on this. And you can see skewness and kurtosis. Uh, some of the things do with lensing, and other parts work with peculiar velocities. Um, so I'm going to skip the measuring structure, because I'm essentially out of time. Um, but apart to, from the fact that to say that the baryon acoustic oscillations, which we're doing both with DES and with future um, surveys, um, will be an even more precise measure of the expansion rate of the universe than supernovae. Um, so here's an example of a baryon acoustic oscillation detection from 2005 from Eisenstein et al. And that's already improved enormously with this is the Wiggles measurement that we made, this is an early BOSS measurement, and this is what the latest BOSS measurement showing really precise acoustic peaks um, which can be used as a standard ruler instead of a standard candle. And these measure very precise um, distances, partly because they're so easy to measure. All you measure are redshifts and angles, and you can, you can make your large-scale structure measurement. Um, so this is what the existing data sort of looks like. It's a slightly old plot with distance versus redshift, um, comparing supernova here to the data points that you can get for distance from baryon acoustic oscillations. The data points are fewer for baryon acoustic oscillations, but they're more precise. 
And if you get rid of the supernovae completely, just the BAO in this plot require acceleration. And that's been true since about 2011. Um, I'll finish on this because I wanted to mention DESI, which is not DES, it's the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. It's a new thing which will be starting in 2018 and it will be a spectrograph. It has 5,000 fibres and will um, be doing an even better um, baryon acoustic oscillation survey measuring many, many redshifts, um, 30 million galaxy redshifts as opposed to, for example, Wiggles that had 250,000 and um, Sloan which has a bit over a million. Um, and this kind of measurement is what you might expect, where the black dots are the predicted DESI measurements for scale factor of the universe versus time. And if you put the predicted graph on this thing that I tried to show before, it's getting very hard to see. So we will have very accurate measurements of the expansion of the universe after DESI. And my claim is essentially that after DESI, we don't want to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to bother to measure any more precisely. That's, that's um, as close as I want to do to, to measuring the expansion of the universe. So there's lots and lots more stuff that can be done from the CMB stuff I measured, mentioned, measuring neutrino mass, time dilation, AGN as I mentioned are close to my heart. We can potentially use those as standard candles as well. Uh, but um, I'll conclude with the, the sort of philosophical point that measuring something precisely doesn't actually tell you what it is. So for this, we need theoretical insight and this is the kind of thing that I've been really excited to work with Patty on in, in the past and I'm hoping that we can uh, learn more from the theory that's coming from uh, this group and from uh, India and your, your legacy, Patty. So thanks very much. Questions? I, I actually remember Paddy gave a talk back in like 2002, 3, 4 sometime in Australia at the GMT meeting where he made the statement that uh, we should already give up on trying to measure the equation of state of dark energy. I don't know if you are still of this opinion. Uh, just in the sense that, uh, and at the time I think you said where it's clearly going to be minus one. It's just theoretically so obvious that that has to be the case. Now we just have to explain why theoretically why it is minus one. Um, and the reason, but the reason I'm saying that I will give up is that there are systematic uncertainties. There's nonlinear structure growth. There's a whole bunch of things that mean that it gets increasingly difficult to make reliable measurements of the expansion rate. Um, and to the precision that we need to be able to constrain cosmology, we will, um, it won't be useful to go further than a certain point, in my opinion. So you'll become a theorist? I'll re revert to being a theorist. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>